Welcome to Chapter Connect. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Radke, Vice President for Chapters at the Explorers Club. Last week, we visited the Southwest Chapter of the Explorers Club. Today, we are taking you across the continent and across the Atlantic, all the way to Poland to visit with the Polish Chapter. The head of the Polish Chapter is Chapter Chair Mariusz Zielkowski. Uh, he's a professor of archaeology of the Americas and director of the Center for Andean Studies in Cusco at the University of Warsaw. He's also an extraordinary professor at the Universidad Católica Santa Maria de Arequipa, Peru. He specializes in Inca archaeology and ethnohistory, absolute dating techniques, and archaeoastronomy. He has taken part in archaeological work in Poland, Iraq, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Among his publications are two books. The first, Pachap Unacha, The Metropolitan Calendar of the Inca State, the other is Myths, Rituals, and Politics of the Incas. In 1998, he was decorated with the Order of Merit by the government of the Republic of Peru. And in his pastimes, he, he holds a black belt in judo, and he is a former member of the University of Warsaw judo team. Mariusz, welcome to Chapter Connect. Thank you, team. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy uh, to uh, begin this uh, uh, meeting with our Polish chapter of the Explorers Club. Uh, let me say some words about uh, our chapter. We have 32 members of the chapter and uh, the representation of scientists is uh, rather strong. Among those 32 members, we have uh, six archaeologists, for example. Uh, our headquarters is uh, located in the University of Warsaw campus uh, in the center of Andean studies. I am the head of this uh, center. And uh, we, uh, as a part of the uh, archaeologists, uh, among our members, we have underwater explorers, Himaya, uh, Himalaya climbers, cavers, uh, uh, kayakers, biologists, filmmakers, writers, journalists, etc. Uh, usually we have uh, two meetings uh, per year in spring uh, the before the covid epidemic uh, we had the meetings in the uh, castle of malborg the medieval castle of malborg uh, uh, and uh, the second one uh, 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 is during the ceremony of benedictus Polo, uh, polonus award uh, so uh, this is the general organization. We have also uh, meetings uh, uh, related to the person of professor, the late professor Andrzej Wierczyński, lectures, Wierczyński's lectures every year in this December. And uh, we, uh, the status of our chapter is uh, a non-profit organization recognized by the Polish law. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's help to the members uh, to apply for uh, government uh, fundings, etc. And uh, that's uh, the general uh, highlights of the uh, of the uh, our chapter. And now I would like to introduce Monika Rogozinska, one of the founder members of the uh, of our chapter, and she will give you a short. Uh, uh, abstract of the origins of our uh, chapter. Monica, up to you now. I was asked to tell how the Polish chapter was established. In 1993, I was introduced to a handsome man who came from the United States with a special mission. He was a Polish kayaker who, together with a group of fellow Polish students, explored rivers of South America and one of the deepest canyons in, of the world, the Kolka Canyon in the Andes of Peru. His name was Jurek Majerczyk. He lived in New Jersey and became a member of the Express Club. Jurek invited 17 people for a meeting in Warsaw and told us about the club. He said with great enthusiasm, let's set up a Polish chapter. This meeting became the founding one. It gathered polar explorers, sailors, 
archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists, climbers, spellologists, journalists, men and three women. The formal beginning of the Polish chapter took place in the Royal Castle of Warsaw in June 1993. But the process of registration of the chapter took three more years of effort, efforts in the post communist courts. As a secretary of the Polish chapter, I led this process with its chair, a great man and explorer, Maciej Kuczyński. He was a writer, polar explorer, climber, organizer of paleontological expedition to the Gobi Desert, leader of expeditions to the caves in different continents. One of them discovered the first known quartzite cave in the Sarisariniama Plateau of Venezuela. Maggi Kuczynski was invited to the Explorers Club and had been a member 11 years before the Polish chapter was founded but he was not the first Pole in the club. As the newly formed Polish chapter, we had a debt to be paid to the Polish heroes of exploration of the past centuries who remained unknown, forgotten, or doomed to oblivion because of the difficult history of Poland, partitions by neighboring countries for more than a hundred years, two world wars, the Iron Wall, Soviet occupation. We found out how close to the beginnings of the Explorers Club was a Polish polar explorer, Henry Karstowski. He was a scientific leader during the first winter expedition to the Antarctic region aboard the Belgica ship in the end of 19th century. Among the members of his expedition, of this expedition, were Roald Amundsen and American physician Friedrich Cook later the president of the Explorers Club. In 1920, Henry Kartstowski became the first Pole in the club. Polish Antarctic Station, founded by one of the Polish chapter members, was named after Kartstowski. A few days ago, uh, this is quite news, K2, the Savage Mountain, was summited for the first time ever in winter. Sherpas did it from the Pakistani side. It is a good opportunity to remind the leader of the first ever and successful winter expedition to Mount Everest in 1979-80, Andrzej Zabada, a member of the Polish chapter, as well as another member, Krzysztof Wielicki, who reached the summit. Zavada was a pioneer of the winter conquest of 8,000ers. An interesting fact, fact is that a few years earlier, in late autumn, in icefall of Everest film, a Polish expedition photographed footprints of a yeti. We have those pictures in the archives. Zavada and Wielicki later led different winter expeditions to K2 during the first ever winter expedition to K2 from the Chinese side, I carried with Krzysztof Wielicki the flag of the Explorers Club. The Polish chapter enters 28th year of activity. A new generation is taking the flag of exploration to the future. And I can finally rest in peace. Thank you very much, Monica, for this uh, interesting presentation of the origins of our chapter. Uh, about the activities, uh, among different activities of the chapter, uh, we may mention uh, the collaboration with UNESCO. We organized uh, three years ago in the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris uh, uh, conference and uh, exhibition uh, on the Polish activities uh, in archaeology and uh, conservation of monuments in 35 uh, different sites from the uh, World Heritage List of the UNESCO. Uh, we organize also conferences on underwater archaeology, on inter an international conference on wreck exploration, 
and uh, on uh, exploration on Siberia. This was uh, just uh, two months ago, and online, obviously, uh, this time uh, conference. And uh, our program uh, for uh, tonight uh, is uh, uh, divided in three blocks with uh, 11 uh, presentation and 12 uh, speakers. And uh, now I would like to introduce uh, uh, Marcin Jankowski, uh, who is in charge of the first block uh, about the underwater exploration and uh, will, uh, he will uh, uh, tell you also about uh, one of the award of the prize, the Benedictus Polonus prize uh, uh, invented by our chapter. Uh, Marcin, now it's your time. Hello, everybody. Mariusz, thank you very much for introducing me and thank you very much, everybody, for having us here. It's really great honor to uh, speak about our chapter, our activities, and uh, it's uh, really a pure pleasure for me to see all the friends uh, online here. Um, about this Benedictus Polonus Award, I would like to tell you a little bit about. This is something that we invented at uh, Polish chapter of the Explorers Club. This is the award that um, is given annually uh, to scientists. It's given to one Polish and one foreign scientist working with Polish um, guys. And also it's given to some explorers. It honors uh, 13th century Polish explorer. Uh, he was a monk, uh, Benedictus Polonus, uh, sent by the Pope from Lyon. Uh, popes did not see it at that time in Vatican. And he was sent to Mongolian Han capital of uh, Karakorum. Together with the other monk, he completed a diplomatical mission. He delivered uh, Pope's letter to the Han and brought, brought back uh, the Mongolian answer. He also brought first written account on the Mongolia, China, and the lands and states that were on the way from Europe to the Asian plains. And uh, it's, uh, it's worth to remember that it was approximately half of a century before famous Marco Polo trip. So that was pretty bold expedition at that time, I have to say. This um, award, Benedictus Polonus Award, that, um, that we give um, had already had six editions. And so far, we awarded uh, Orientalists, Maya script expert, a kayaker who solo crossed the Atlantic, an astrophysicist, a musicologist, a polar uh, sailor, cave diver, Copernicus grave discoverer, um, first woman who solo and unassisted went to the South Pole, an ethnographer and anthropologist, Polish language researchers from uh, Tokyo, from, uh, and, um, uh, and experts in Polish history from Latvia, from Italy, and from Scotland. Uh, the Scot, um, by the way, came wearing kilt uh, at the award uh, ceremony. This award was um, usually presented either at the 1,000 years old church that Benedictus Polonus visited on his expedition um, in 12th century, or um, at the royal castles in Warsaw or in Krakow last year. The award uh, comes with a diploma, which is written in Latin, which is very nice, and with some money. It's around $5,000 on the check. Our sponsor for this is Minister of Culture and National Heritage. Okay, um, thank you very much. Now let's go to the presentations. Um, this block will have four presentations about underwater exploration, and it will be. We will have two uh, presentations about Baltic. Baltic Sea is extremely interesting um, area. It's uh, historically very important because it's uh, the sea that is between Russia and Germany, Sweden and Poland. And <clears throat> those nations um, had a lot of wars in the past. So we have a lot of ships lost in the sea and a lot of shipwrecks. And they are very well preserved because of um, very special conditions that are in the Baltic Sea. 
Also, we will have presentation about Vistula River and about the deepest underwater cave. This will be the last in this block that I will uh, present. So now let's go to the first uh, presenter. This will be uh, Tomasz Stachura. Tomek is engineer, diver, and to many people, uh, Santi may ring some uh, bells. Uh, this is the company that he um, uh, runs and he produces dry suits for divers uh, they are, that are very popular. And um, Tomasz today will present, um, will tell us um, about um, his exploration of Karlsruhe shipwreck in the Baltic Sea. Tomasz, the floor is yours. Baltic Sea is one of the best places for wreck diving on the entire planet. Why? For many reasons. First reason is biological. We do not have too much um, oxygen and, and, and salt level is very low. So this water preserve a special uh, wooden wreck preserve in the perfect condition. Second reason is weather. Weather here in Baltic is unpredictable and uh, waves are very short. So in the past, especially in the past, a lot of sailors have to give up and uh, lie on the on the bottom. The last reason, the most important, is historical. Uh, for many years, neighbors were not so friendly to each other, so Russian fighting to, to Swedish, Swedish to Danish, Danish to uh, others, and German uh, general, general to each other, to, to all, to all neighbor. And uh, uh, somebody says that on the, on the bottom we have here in the Baltic Sea 100,000 wrecks altogether. Uh, some of them are very famous, like Vasa uh, from, uh, from Stockholm and, and Mars, which sank in the 15th century and is preserved in the perfect condition. And the most important thing which happened on the Baltic Sea is uh, Operation Hannibal, uh, the biggest maritime evacuation ever. Altogether, uh, two million people were evacuated on the end of Second World War from East Prussia to, to the West Europe, to Copenhagen, to Schwaneminde, and so on. During this operation, uh, 1,000 ships and uh, different vessels uh, evacuate civilian and the rest of uh, Nazi army from East Prussia. 245 ships sank during this operation, 100 uh, were salvaged after the Second World War, but something like 150 still lie on the bottom. The most recognizable wreck is of course Wilhelm Guslov. Uh, this is the biggest maritime disaster ever, approximately between 6,000 to 10,000 people die. Uh, over there. Uh, two years ago, I had great opportunity to make inventory of the biggest um, uh, maritime disaster on the Baltic Sea, like Guslov, Goya, and Steuben. Uh, on the end, I, I released book The Road of Death, um, focusing on the Operation Hannibal. And when I released this book, I, um, I realized that still are some ships on the bottom uh, which are not found yet, like uh, Posen, like like O13, but the most important was steamer Karlsruhe. Why? First, this ship uh, left Pilava, the, the harbor of Königsberg, as the last ship before um, Russian Red Army uh, captured the, 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 the Königsberg. So if the German have to send something important to the West, the Karlsruhe ship was the, the last occasion for them. Uh, in April 2020, I had great opportunity to be a leader of the of the team, which looking of the of the ships. Finally, we found 22 wrecks, and one with this wreck was exactly in the size like Karlsruhe was, so 66 meters. June 2020, we dived there. Uh, the depth is really um, huge because it is 88 meters, so it's more. It's, it's approximately 300. Uh, feet. So we, ha we, we can spend on the bottom only, um, only 25 minutes. But finally, I took uh, some pictures 
And during the summer 2020, we organized free expedition, dive expedition. Uh, I take a lot of pictures and we definitely confirm that Karlsruhe, this is the ships, uh, what we found. Uh, why this ship is so important? Because normal the ships which uh, took a part in Hannibal operation were focused on the passengers only, and these ships uh, bring on the on the deck 360 tons of the cargo. We can imagine what was important for Germans in 1945, and uh, if they put something on the deck, it must be really important. And the, some rumor says that maybe it's amber room here. You know, of course, it sounds perfect, but uh, on the on the very beginning, I were I was not so enthusiastic about this. But when I digging in the archives, I realized that we have like one or two percent of chance that Amber Room were on the Karlsruhe. Uh, we were so convinced. So December 2020, we organized the last expedition. In this time, we we use uh, underwater robots. We we were equipped in the really huge ship Mintaka One uh, with fantastic multi beams and so on. And we sent Aerof out to the bottom for the 20 hours altogether. We filming this. We found more like 14 chests on the bottom, wooden chests. Some of them were open, and in the one chest we probably found some. Paints. So it's confirmed that, that there are really some something important in the cargo. So uh, season 2021 20, looks very promising. Uh, we we have planned to come back to the Karlsruhe. Uh, of course, uh, we want to dive there. We want to use Aerof, but we can't forget that uh, that Karlsruhe is uh, is is wet grave because 970 people die over there and we have to think about this when we are when we are on the bottom take care thank you very much thomas for your wonderful presentation it was very very nice to uh, to hear this story we are still staying in the uh, baltic sea area our next presenter will be commodore Benedict Hatz, uh, who is retired, uh, retired um, soldier, retired um, mariner from uh, Polish Navy, and uh, Benedict or Benek, as we uh, shortly call him, is um, the one who knows what is in the water, what is underwater, without any diving, because he is great expert in sonars and echo sounders. And today he will tell us about Stuttgart, which is probably the most dangerous shipwreck in the South Baltic Sea. Benedict, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a member of Polish section of our club. My life's adventure is to discover the mysteries laying at the bottom of the sea. During the years of my activity, I have found several dozen wrecks on the bottom of the South Baltic. I had the opportunity to discover them and learn their secrets. There are many well-known wrecks in Baltic. Some of them have a terrible history like the Wilhelm Gustloff, Steuben, Goya or others. Some of them are historically valuable. But many of them, many wrecks from Second World War, are simply dangerous for the environment. Today, I am pleased to say a few sentences about the most dangerous of them, the Stuttgart Hospital shipwrecks. The remains of this beautiful modern ship, which lay near the port of Gdynia in the Gulf of Gdańsk, are a threat to the entire Gulf. In particular, protected areas in this region of the sea, all forms of life, including mainly seabirds and fish, are endangered. However, the most endangered areas are the beaches located, located just uh, two kilometers from the wreck and the people living there. Since over a million people live there, that uh, threat is high. 
Just before World War II, the passenger line in Stuttgart was very well equipped. During the war, she was converted into a hospital ship. It could carry several hundred wounded soldiers and medical personnel. In December uh, 1943, it stood in the port in, of Gdynia. During a bombing ride, American bombers hit her with three bombs. The hospital ship was co uh, covered with camouflage nets against international conventions. The fire could not be extinguished after the attack, so the burning ship was towed from the harbor and sunk with the bodies of several hundred wounded soldiers, nurses and doctors. Flying over the wreck, we see how little remains of this beautiful passenger ship. After the war, the wreck, which lay very close to the entrance to the port of Houdina, uh, was an obstacle to navigation. It had to be removed, but she was in bad condition and could not be lifted. So it was dismantled using explosives. The steel was cut up and transported to a steelworks. No one back then cared about the environment the way we do today. Fixing one problem caused no other, much bigger one. The tanks of these wrecks contain more uh, than 1,000 tons of heavy fuel made from coal. Most of this heavier than water fuel spilled out of the ship's tank and spread across the bottom. Some of the fuel leaked into the sand, some is still on the surface of the bottom, uh, in form of small lakes. It is unfortunate that the wrecks lay on the slope of small underwater valley, so the leaking fuel has contaminated a huge area of the seabed. Samples taken from seabed contain a large amount of hydrated fuel. Marine animals, especially shellfish, are dying in large numbers from exposure to this contamination. This is what they look like when taken out of the water. What it looks like at the bottom is shown in a short video. In 2018, we made a 40 minutes long film about the wreck for the Discovery Channel. The uh, film shows large lakes of clean fuel spilled on the seafloor. Under a thin layer of silt lies about 800 tons of heavy fuel that is dangerous to marine life even after 75 years. Divers uh, could see a small damaged hull and huge patch of fuel. Thank you very much, Benedict, for your presentation. I'm a little worried and about this uh, condition of this shipwreck and about the contamination of the uh, Polish coast that may happen. And I hope next time we will hear something about the methods that were uh, designed to take care of this very dangerous situation. Now, uh, let's go to another, uh, to the next speaker. This will be Hubert Kowalski. Hubert is archaeologist and he is art historian. And I'm very lucky person because I can also call him uh, my personal friend. And a few years ago, uh, Hubert found 350 years old letters that um, put him and also me on a treasure hunt expedition. And also, uh, with the help of uh, a few more friends, Kostek Kulik and Marzena Chmielewicz, I, would, I uh, shoot a film about this expedition, River of Treasures, that premiered at the Explorers Club headquarters two years ago. So Hubert will tell us about underwater 
rescue of artifacts from Swedish occupation of Poland in 17th century. Right after Hubert, there will be my presentation about the deepest underwater cave. But for now, Hubert, I would like to invite you and the floor is yours. In the 17th century, Poland and Sweden, two countries divided by the Baltic Sea, shared their ruling dynasty, the House of Vasa. The century-long Vasa rule gave Sweden spectacular development, a true golden age. For Poland, it meant wars, the Swedish deluge, and an unparalleled looting of cultural property. Carl Gustav, he had huge plans for the future. He, he planned to, of course, to, to take the crown of Poland also, and actually he should create a huge country. They just went there for, for grabbing land and, and goods. That, it was a, a, a really bandit war. There was nothing left in Warsaw after the Swedish deluge. If you add wartime destruction, the Warsaw Uprising, remodeling, reconstruction, we have hardly no original 17th century architecture left. This is the story of robbed treasures and of expeditions that spent years searching for them. This is a tale of power, greed, struggle, and reconciliation. A tale in which one country shoots up at the expense of the other. But most of all, it is the story of the power of science and knowledge. Thank you very much, Hubert, for this. And now we're moving to the cave. Hello again. Thank you for the invitation to talk about my explorations. And today I would like to share the experience from the expedition to mm, search for the deepest underwater cave. By education, I'm a chemist specialized in Raman spectroscopy, but for the last um, more than two decades, I've worked as a professional filmmaker and uh, writer. For five years, I was editor-in-chief of Polish edition of National Geographic magazine. My first explorations were about mm, climbing and were about mountains. I went for um, two big expeditions to Mali and to Madagascar to mm, search for uh, the new uh, walls and to open new climbing routes in hand of Fatima and famous Saranoro regions. I also joined the search for the Amazon source. It was National Geographic expedition to Peru. And it's probably where I first thought that matching exploration and science is the best uh, method of um, exploring the world. So mm, very quickly I joined archaeologists in Rapa Nui caves and I joined Egyptologists to search for ancient tombs of Sudan. But still underwater exploration was very close to, to my heart. Uh, so I led National Geographic expedition to Steuben's shipwreck in the Baltic Sea and I traveled to search for East India uh, wreck in Sierra Leone in Africa. The expedition that I mentioned at the very beginning um, began in 2012 and um, I searched for the deepest underwater cave with Krzysztof Starnawski. He is legendary Polish cave diver with experience in caves of Mexico, France, Spain, Italy and Balkans. Chris was expedition leader and he put bets on a cave in Czech Republic called Hranicka Propaist. Very quickly we put up together a big Polish Czech team and it was really international team of uh, 30 men cave divers and cavers and we got uh, some support from National Geographic Expeditions Council thank you very much Rebecca Martin at that time working in NatGeo this is very unusual place this is the cave that is formed at the top of the hill and it looks a little bit like volcano. So when you go into the cave, you first go like into the caldera of the volcano. On the bottom is little lake. Fortunately, not the lake of the molten lava, but just lake like with water. It's the entrance 
to the cave. Water, unfortunately, is murky. Visibility sometimes is only one, two meters. But fortunately, the deeper you go, the better it gets. And the Chris was our push diver. And with each dive over four years, because it took us more than four years, he was able to reach new depths, 180, 200, 220, and 265 meters deep. His decompressions were very long. It was five to 10 hours. Every dive ended in big underwater tank that was improvised recompression chamber, like a, a diving bell. And when he got bored, he read books. The world record at the time was 100 meters more, so we asked one more man to join us, and it was engineer Bartek Grinda from uh, Gral Marine from Poland, and we asked him to upgrade his ROV, which is remotely operated vehicle that he built uh, by himself, and um, we asked him to upgrade it so it could operate uh, easily in the cave. And with this little yellow submarine that he built and with the guidance help from Chris Starnowski, Bartek's ROV broke the world record finally. And we set new one, it's now 404 meters, that's the deepest underwater cave uh, on the planet. This expedition mapped entire new part of the cave. And for me, it was also best kind of exploration, because this was exploration where science meets adventure and meets travel. I just love that kind of stuff. Thank you very much, Marcin. And uh, now uh, we will uh, uh, have a blog on terrestrial exploration and the host will be Andrew Piętowski. Andrew, the floor is yours. The next block of presentations is about the land explorations. Well, I heard a few times opinions that there is not much to explore nowadays on land on the surface, that almost everything was done, that satellites are taking pictures at, uh, on days and nights. But we here in Polish chapter, we just contradict this uh, frivolous opinions, okay? We have uh, among our members people who are walking or just uh, crossing the vast lands of Siberia. They are bringing incredible materials and news from there. Uh, there are people who are crossing on foot and even solo crossing on foot the biggest deserts of, of the planet, like the Sahara Desert or Gobi. And there are people also who are walking inside uh, of our territories in Poland. They are walking along the rivers and now they're planning to walk along the 500 kilometers of Polish coast on the, on the Baltic Sea. Talking to people of uh, many walks of life and uh, trying to make a, a picture of the needs and of the dangers that we now uh, witness especially like we heard before, there are wrecks, there are underwater, uh, they can pollute, there is other, uh, pollute the lands, there is other uh, problem with the uh, national parks or with the uh, with species that are very, very much endangered. So, our first speaker will be Tomasz Grzywaczewski, who is, uh, who already had a presentation in headquarters of uh, of the Exos Club in, in New York City. His specialty is uh, Siberia. Si si Siberia for Polish people is not just like Alaska for the Americans, because we have very sad history, about thousands of people taken there and just left to vanish or to come back after a long time. Uh, Tomasz will be just talking about the dead road. That's the uh, trail or just a road on which uh, these poles were taken deep into Siberia and many, many of them didn't return. <coughs> Tomasz, the, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Tomasz Grzybaczewski and I would like to tell you the story of one of my journeys, the expedition Dead 
Rome, which aim was to explore the remnants of Stalinist's ghost railway, which was built in the very in the northernmost part of the uh, Siberia in the 40s and 50s by the, the prisoners of gulags, of the system of uh, labor camps created by uh, Stalin. Here is uh, the map of our journey. We started from Krasnoyarsk, from where we flowed down the river Yenisei to Turuhansk. From Turuhansk, we took uh, the motorboat and helicopter to reach small settlement of Yanovstan, and from Yanovstan we started the uh, exploration of um, uh, of uh, Dead Road. Um, the, our team um, consists of five people, including um, Maciej, Wukasz, Marek, and Anya, the researcher from New York University, which was our official partner. Here is a very small village of Farkovo. It is uh, actually close to the um, to the um, Dead Road. It is mostly inhabited by um, indigenous people called Selkups, and this man on the left, Dima, is a hunter, a professional hunter, and he decided to join us, to help us in our research and to take care of us when we are traveling across the taiga. The last part of our trip we did by the helicopter because there are no any roads in, in, in that part of Siberia. It's impossible to drive there. The only way, mean of communication is, uh, is helicopter. And by helicopter we will reach the Yanovstan settlement. It is um, extremely small. There are only, um, namely speaking, two people um, living there. One dog and one cat, as you can see. Uh, and just next to the settlement, there is there are first first remnants of of the railway. Here you can see the wagons, the train. Uh, this um, this um, um, dead road, officially named Transpolar Mainline, um, was never completed because the project was abandoned immediately after the Stalin's death in 1933. And it um, and um, it was it is really well preserved. It looks uh, almost like uh, this uh, dreadful times of Stalin. So we can hear that, for instance, you can see in bridges. Um, thanks to um, thanks to um, Dima's assistance, we are really safe. He really took care of us. He was hunting. He was checking if there are no one birds on our on our route. So we're really safe, and we managed to discover a few. Mm, uh, a few ruins of this um, the Soviet labor camps. This is a watchtower, this is a park where prisoners uh, lived. Uh, there uh, we also um, um, uh, found some personal items of the prisoners, like bowls, shoes, or even, uh, even jackets. No one knows how many people died there, but it is at least uh, around 20,000 um, innocent people, the victims of Stalinist communist um, error, uh, and I can say that this part of um, of um, um, Dead Road um, is, um, well, I suppose, we're one of the first researchers who managed to um, to uh, to get there. Um, so um, so I can say that it was not only uh, like travel, but it also has some scientific in, uh, scientific in impact. But I am also um, very proud that we managed to meet um, a, a people of Siberia who are living there for ages, um, and um, and uh, that we managed to make friendship um, with with uh, some of them thanks to their help we managed to do this um, expedition. So so it was not only meeting with this, as I said, dreadful past, but also with the contemporary people who are living in the one of the most remote and desolated parts of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tomasz, for your work on vast territories of this no man's land. Thank you for your effort. And now I would like to introduce Andrzej Ciszewski, who is a speleo speleologist. He is uh, involved right now with underground of China, means that he's penetrated, he's exploring unknown or very little known caves in that large country. Andrzej, please take care of this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andrzej Ciszewski. 
I am a member of the Explorers Club since 1998. I have been involved in cave exploration for almost 50 years and I am a leader of expeditions to Lamprechtofen cave system that is the deepest cave in Europe. In 2012 I started organizing caving expeditions to China together with my son Michał Ciszewski and my life partner Ewa Wojcik who is also a member of the Explorers Club since 2009. We explored and documented cave in Dalou Shan Mai mountain range in Hubei province together with our Chinese partners. In the effect of our expeditions, we surveyed 85 caves with a total length of 59 kilometers and 940 meters. In addition, we participated in three research projects with partners from the Institute of Cars Geology in Guilin. During these projects, we mapped more than 6,000 meters of cave passages. Our expeditions were based in two areas in the vicinity of Lichuan city. We explored caves of different types, including deep vertical pits and spacious horizontal passages. The expeditions were organized in autumn to avoid the risk of flooding, because many sump zones may fill very quickly. On the way to many cave entrances, we had to walk through dense vegetation. Even in some of the caves, the light permits growth of the plants on the bottom of entrance pits. The most interesting cave in our exploration is called Wang Jia Cao, a cave of Wang family. It is located in the area of Nulan Ping Tsun village, where we had our expedition base. In the cave we reached a depth of 477 meters and we mapped 9612 meters of passages, but exploration has not been finished. The cave is unique because of its geologic setting and an active underground stream that leads to an extensive periodic sump zone of impressive size. On the way down, we had to traverse over or walk through hundreds of pools. The rock in the cave is very colorful. We found bizarre mud formations and rare spelel themes. The second large cave is called Luo Shi Tian Kang, that means big pit of a falling river. The cave is distinguished by an enormous 320 meters deep entrance pit with its bottom measuring 160 by 120 meters. We estimated its total volume to 3 million cubic meters. From the bottom of the pit leads a giant corridor that is over 1 kilometer long and finishes in a terminal siphon at a depth of 433 meters. Our exploration in China was stopped suddenly by the coronavirus pandemic in 2019. We hoped that the situation would come back to normal and we may be able to continue the exploration project in this remote underground world of Hubei province. Welcome our next speaker, who is Mateusz Waligura, young explorer, very, accom very accomplished one. He did a solo crossing of the Gobi Desert, for, for which he was awarded uh, some prize of our Polish chapter. Uh, today he returned to Poland. We think that we know everything about our countries, but this is not true. He is going to. He was going. Uh, he was walking along the longest river in Poland, the Vistula River, and now he's planning on taking on coast of the Baltic Sea, 500 kilometers. Talking people of many walks of life who live from the sea, who live uh, on the, in the coastline, and then he wants to bring a comprehensive picture. What is the condition? of our coast. There are many, many endangering factors like those wrecks that are leaking some pollutants and also other pollutants from the land. Mateusz, please take the microphone. Hello, my name is Mateusz Waligura. I'm the youngest member of the Polish branch of the Explorers Club. 
I specialize in the exploration of the desert places from Australia to South America. In 2018, I was the first person in the world to walk alone through the Mongolian part of the Gobi Desert. I started my expedition in the town of Burgan in Hoft province in western Mongolia and after 58 days and almost um, 1875 kilometers I reached the city of Sainshant in Dorongovi, Aymag. When the COVID pandemic changed the plans of all my next expeditions, I focused on educational projects in Poland. Last year, I walked uh, almost 1,200 kilometers along the Wisła, the longest uh, Polish river and one of the last such great uh, white rivers in Europe. Uh, During the walk, I talked with uh, scientists and researchers and thanks to the cooperation with the radio stations and uh, television and the Polish branch of the National Geographic, I told to Polish people about the current situation um, of the Wisła River. This project uh, will be continued soon, uh, but this time I will, uh, I will be walking along the um, Polish coast of the Baltic Sea. At the same time, I am intensively preparing for the expedition to the South Pole, which I would like to start um, at the end of the next year. I plan to ski from the Hercules Inlet uh, base to the South Pole uh, and then back, alone, totally unsupported and unassisted. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mateusz. We continue our terrestrials, terrestrial explorations. Uh, we were talking about Poland, about Sa- Siberia, about deserts of the world, but there is a vast black continent, Africa. Poles were exploring that continent for, I would say, the last two or three centuries. The very, uh, very frequent explorations were done in the 30s of the in the 30s of the of last of the 20th century, and uh, people were bringing lots of information. It was the time, you know, we didn't have computers, we didn't have telephones, we didn't have anything. I would like to present Maciej Klusak, who is African researcher. He is writing based on information that he brings from Africa. This time he will be following another explorer, another Polish explorer, uh, Mr. Scholz Rogoziński, who was very, very active in Cameroon in last century. Maciej, please take the floor. Hello, uh, everybody. My name is Maciej Klusak. I'm greeting you from uh, Casablanca in Morocco. It will be an honor for me to share some of my recent works related to the continent I, I, I live in now, and more precisely to the historical exploring of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. The person I'd like to present you is the great Polish explorer, uh, Stefan Rogoziński, uh, who organized the first Polish expedition to, to Africa in the 19th century. He chose Cameroon because it still remained the partially unknown land. Uh, so far, I, I led uh, two expeditions to Africa following the footsteps of Rogozinski in 2014 and 16. The second one was awarded uh, the Explorers Club uh, flag. Uh, we entered all countries Rogozinski explored, but, uh, but uh, we focused on Cameroon as, as he did. The time in Cameroon was very active. Um, uh, first, we took a boat to the remote Mondoli Island. You see it at this uh, photo where he established his scientific base. So we climbed uh, Mount Cameroon uh, of over 13,000 feet. Uh, we visited numerous towns and villages. Uh, but the most solemn moment of, of, of the whole story of the second expedition was the unveiling of the commemorative uh, plaque on the wall of Chief Mondoli Palace with the participation of Chief himself and Polish consul. You see them at this photo and with the participation of a big Mondoli community. Our trip successfully reached Nigeria. It was across a part of Gulf of Guinea, uh, controlled by pirates, uh, but we were quite lucky. Uh, we were also in Liberia, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and Ivory Coast. Uh, we did not forget uh, European countries related uh, 
uh, to Rogozinski's activities, uh, I mean, Portugal and France. Uh, a part of the research is being done in the libraries and museums, and uh, I did already successful queries in London and Paris, uh, because believe me, it's not really easy to find any document in, in, in Africa. Uh, we published a book, a comic book, an amazing online game, uh, gave dozens of, of lectures. Uh, we, we, we have planned the next trip to Gabon uh, November last year, but uh, the pandemic situation made us postpone it. Uh, uh, why did I do this? Uh, first, uh, thanks to these observations, we can confirm or, or rectify some historical uh, facts. Uh, but secondly, what is more important is to judge the, the role of Rogozinski in the exploring, exploring of Africa, which seems to be underestimated or at least not very well known. Uh, uh, because Rogozinski was not only the explorer, but he was a great visionary of different Africa, uh, different uh, than the colonial model adopted by the European powers at the Berlin Conference in 1885. His relations with Africans were innovative and uh, radically different from those typical for Europeans uh, whose expeditions at uh, um, this time, uh, that time were mostly plundering. Uh, we should regret his partnership approach did not win as we could have less geopolitical problems now. Uh, he was recognized in Europe. He was the member of uh, geographical societies in Paris, uh, and London, it's just a pity he, he died several years before our club was uh, established. Uh, well, it would be all. Um, I thank you very much for, for, for listening. I, I hope you liked uh, this mix of exploring Africa and uh, history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, now we will start with the last blog on cultural heritage. And I will be the host of this blog. And uh, we have the presentation both on material and unmaterial uh, heritage, cultural heritage. And uh, let's start with uh, a very interesting uh, presentation uh, related uh, to the traditional culture of Papua New Guinea. Uh, the speakers, uh, our two members of our chapter, Anna Urbańska and Jakub Urbański, are both biologists, and, uh, but uh, also uh, travelers. And they dedicate their free time precisely to this uh, very, still very little known part of the world. So, uh, Anna and Jakub, the floor is yours. We are going to the land of the cannibals. Hi, I am, I'm Anka. Uh, we are the members of the Polish chapter and we would like to tell you about the West Papua. Uh, Jakub uh, Urbanski. Uh, hi. Um, we've been traveling uh, uh, ever ever since uh, for some past 20, uh, 20 years. We visited numerous countries in Asia, Africa, and, and Pacific. Um, but uh, in 2005, uh, we've uh, reached the uh, um, western part of the uh, New Guinea, uh, uh, formerly known as Irian Jaya, now uh, uh, recognized as West Papua. And it has mesmerized us from the very, very first uh, moment. Um, so we are coming back um, from 2005 uh, almost every year there. Um, uh, since we've been completely captivated by local uh, cultures and enormous diversity, um, uh, both means of ethnic and uh, and culture. So uh, West Papua is home to um, almost 300 uh, different cultural um, groups, uh, different tribes with different languages, um, and it's completely unique. Uh, some of the uh, people of the West Papua uh, uh, had been living uh, in uh, 
isolation for for thousands of uh, or hundreds of years, and the only means of contact with the outside world were uh, trade routes, ancient trade routes where people uh, trade uh, stones, uh, shells, uh, salt, and 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 uh, feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, from the very first visit to Papua, uh, we've been documenting uh, vanishing tribal art, culture, recording uh, testimonies of the elders, the people that remember old times, old times meaning that they, they uh, remember the times um, uh, before contact with uh, uh, outside civilizations, either Indonesians or the missionaries. The cultures uh, of Papua had been heavily affected by the missionaries, both Catholic and Protestant. Um, so it's not much left of the uh, cultural richness of the of the Papua. Uh, we've been traveling to uh, numerous tribes. Um, uh, from 2006, we uh, collaborate with uh, museums in Poland, both with National Museum yeah, and uh, Museum of Asia and Pacific. Uh, we've gathered a um, uh, few hundred artifacts from uh, different tribes, mainly Asmak, but also Korowai, Dani, Lani, uh, Bi Biak and Sentani people. Uh, we've shown some of them uh, within two um, exhibitions in the Museum of Asia and Pacific, and uh, 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 the exhibits are core of the permanent exhibition that is planned to be uh, display put up display uh, in the Museum of Asia and Pacific. Uh, uh, since we are coming back to, to Papua, we have established uh, very close relationships with uh, village elders, uh, uh, local community leaders, and it has enabled us to enter the world which is completely out of reach for most of the travelers um, and uh, people from outside. So we've been treated like family members and we uh, were able to witness uh, the ceremonies uh, such as uh, uh, funerals, for example, funeral of Absuron of uh, Yali tribe. Absuron is a big man of, of the Yali tribe. Um, we have published a report from this in National Geographic uh, uh, a few years ago. And uh, uh, we've been investigating in numerous uh, peculiarities and curiosities from Papua, such as uh, um, uh, mummies of the um, uh, Central Mountain Ranch. Uh, people of the Dani and Yali tribe used to um, uh, mummify uh, their elders, uh, the big, big man. Um, uh, for for some fifty, maybe one hundred years, uh, dating back in four hundred years ago, they've uh, uh, preserved their um, most uh, valued and, uh, and uh, men uh, as a, as mummies, and mummies uh, consist important uh, object of uh, of. Uh, um, uh, Old and, and they are treated as a uh, uh, clan or, or family uh, elders. Um, uh, we are planning to, to come back to Papua, uh, digging more and more into the history and uh, um, uh, and culture of uh, of, uh, of tribes and uh, uh, due to our contacts uh, we uh, we uh, were able to um, uh, establish some links with uh, uh, the last quarry where the stone tools are made 
and we are planning uh, to come back to Papua to follow one of the ancient trade routes uh, where people of the Una, uh, Una tribe uh, traded their stone tools with uh, uh, wood and uh, bird feathers and, and, and shells uh, with uh, the people of the Korowai uh, tribe living in the uh, lowland uh, wetlands uh, in, in the southern part of, of the islands. So um, Papua, uh, well, you, well, we can say that Papua became a second uh, home for us, and um, and to, although we we've been, we are traveling all around the world right now, not 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 that much uh, because of COVID, but uh, um, but we think that uh, that it's very very important to. They enchant the Papua because uh, in a in a common um, uh, common uh, uh, myths about Papua are about cannibals and headhunters, uh, but uh, Papua is uh, way beyond of it. Uh, so so it's uh, it's very very uh, fragile uh, culture and very interesting and rich uh, culture that is slowly or not slowly because because in, uh, from 2005 we observed uh, vanishing of the cultures it's, it's vanishing so so we want to preserve as much as possible for for the future generations uh, for our Papuan friends so they 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 know more about the the roots thank you Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Andrzej Piętowski. I'm a vice chair of Polish chapter of the Explorers Club. My professional formation granted me masters of a Master of Arts in Mathematics from Bowling Green State University of Ohio. For 32 years, I was a math teacher in public and international education in the US, Nigeria and Bolivia. My passion is water and mountains. When a river meets mountains, canyons are formed. As a whitewater kayaker, I would like to present to you the Colca Canyon in Peru. Also, on its northern edge begins mighty Amazon River. I organized with Piotr Miliński a scientific expedition Amazon Source 2000, sponsored by National Geographic Society, carrying the Express Club flag number 174. So, let's start our adventure now. Thank you for inviting me to this presentation. Please join me on the expedition to the world's deepest land gorge of the Kolka River in Peru. I was born in Poland, which I left in 1979. I'm also a US citizen, sharing my life between these two countries. But my heart I left in beautiful and colorful Peru. Caduantes group in two years paddled 23 rivers in two Americas, 13 of which were virgin. We were lucky to be the first kayakers who navigated them. We landed in Mexico, but one year later, we arrived by land to Peru. Our eyes were always focused on the Colca River. It was a carcass cherry on the cake. Descent of vertical one kilometer to the river took an entire day. First days of navigation were a pure joy for our eyes and hearts. Our gears were very poor and worn out on 20 rivers. On the fourth day, the river declared war on us disappearing under gigantic boulders. We had to do 21 portages. The worst one took one day to advance only one kilometer. Kayaker Piotr Miliński was our scout, giving signals with his paddle to the raft. Any moment of the concentration could end up with an accident. We emerged from the canyon on day 17, on the water, exhausted by elated knowing that each of us achieved imaginable feat. Overnight, we became celebrities. President of Peru invited us for an audience. Peruvian government granted us five-star trip to Machu Picchu. Poor students from then communist Poland 
suddenly climbed up to the top of the world. Legendary explorer Jacques Cousteau invited us to join him on his Amazon expedition. Only a few days before returning to our families, martial law was imposed in Poland. Airports shut down, solidarity leaders put in jail, and our friends from Kayak Club harassed by the police. We organized chapter of solidarity in Peru. By leading a huge protest marching down the streets of Lima, we burned bridges to Poland for nine long years. On my teacher's vacations, I was returning to Peru every year. A monument commemorating our discovery of the Coca Canyon was unveiled. It is marking the place from which we started our odyssey. All trail to Coca was also marked in many places. Major streets and towns were renamed to remind about Polish explorers. For 10 years, we insisted to publish our story in National Geographic magazine. Finally, we return equipped by its editors with professional, state-of-art river gear. Accompanied by some American paddlers, we reached the deepest section of the Kolka. Here the lead wall towers up for 4,200 meters over our heads. Loaded with adrenaline, we attacked the rapids and cascades class 5 and 6. On January 1993, our dream came true. We saw Cano Andes feet published on 22 pages in Yellow Magazine. We were ecstatic. This publication marks the beginning of massive influx of world tourists to the Kolka region. Paddling Kolka again in 1983, three kayakers trekked up to the source of the Amazon River on the northern slope of the canyon. Later on, we organized an international expedition, Source of the Amazon 2000, with National Geographic Society, carrying the explorer's club flag number 174. Walking with scientific GPSs, we pinpointed the farthest place of that mighty river. Four friends from Kolka 81 expedition formed the core of an international group of Amazon researchers. Wildlife and landscapes around Kolka are truly breathtaking. I always kept a journal to remember endless adventures and events of the day. My notes were later transferred into a book titled Cano Andes. The year 2001 brought us unexpectedly a prestigious award, Grand Colos Rapanui, and an audience with the Polish president in Warsaw. Three of us were decorated with the Cross of Merit of the Polish Republic. Cano Andes group met again in Peru to celebrate 25th anniversary of the conquest of the Coca Canyon. This Peruvian lady works and earns about 4 US dollars a day. Local vendors were happy anyway to have jobs. Natives of Kolka were clearly marginalized. They were not communicative with visitors. The profits were going to English speaking guides. How to help these young kids to make their lives better, I thought. Next year I returned with seven volunteers. We opened first English language summer school in Kolka. In five weeks, first diplomas were distributed. Our kids celebrated their graduation in Hot Springs, La Calera. Mayor of Colca County praised our efforts and invited to continue English education next year. We introduced modern education using audio-video equipment and Rosetta Stone system to help improve students' pronunciation. We reached even to a local kindergarten. On their free time and weekends, volunteers have many opportunities to discover Peru on mountain bikes, or horseback riding, or trekking pristine trails in the Andes. On long weekends, we visit Titicaca Lake and floating islands of Uros Indians, or trek to the bottom of the Colca Canyon. Firecrackers announce the end of English classes. At evening, diplomas were handed in to adult graduates already involved in travel business and administration. You may join us this summer in Peru celebrating 40 years of Kolka discovery or volunteering in our English school in Chivai. I hope you enjoyed my slideshow. Thank you for revisiting my beloved Peru. 
I started to work uh, in the Andes 42 years ago. Uh, my first experience, uh, field experience, uh, was uh, started uh, in the Cordillera Waiwash in the central Andes. I took part in the Polish scientific expedition to the uh, Andes. And uh, next to this first experience, I worked in Ecuador, in the ceremonial center of Ingapirca, also uh, in the Nazca Desert with the Italian archaeological expedition of Professor Giuseppe Orefici. And at the present, uh, I am the head of the Center of Andean Studies uh, of the University of uh, Warsaw in Cusco, Peru. And this center is carrying out different uh, projects, you see her here the list and uh, among those I would like to mention this one I am in charge of the project on uh, the studies of the uh, astronomical observa observatories of the Incas. In the Inca Empire the astronomy uh, and the calendars was uh, very important for the social engineering for the organization of uh, labor of uh, also of the ceremonial life but uh, the problem the main problem is to found the uh, instruments for uh, those uh, observations and uh, where are those observatories and i would like to uh, present you and invite to visit one of those located in the uh, tropical forest on the slopes of uh, Huayna Picchu mountain in the Machu Picchu archaeological path. Let's have a look on, on this short movie about this discovery. This is uh, not the end of our activities uh, there in uh, Machu Picchu Archaeological Park. We have other projects and uh, the collaboration with our Peruvian colleague, especially 
with Fernando Astete uh, Victoria, the former director of the park, and the present one, Jose Bastante uh, Abu Hadba is uh, very, very uh, close, and uh, we hope to be able to come back uh, to uh, Machu Picchu this year in few months to begin uh, the, new, uh, the second part of uh, our studies there. Guys, your life. Okay. Omar well, Yusha, I want to thank you and all of your presenters for the great job they did. Um, I was especially uh, impressed by the scope of the explorations being done by the members of your chapter. It's uh, certainly not all local, that's for sure. <laughs> You're all over the place. Uh, I wanted to start out with a few questions here. Uh, the first one was for, for Benedict, as far as the, the, the heavy heavy fuel that's at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of the ocean there near Gdansk. Is there any plan on removing that and how difficult will it be? Yeah, at the moment uh, this situation is quite stable. Uh, steel is uh, uh, fuel on the bottom, but we are uh, working on project how to uh, uh, destroy this uh, uh, this how to remove this fuel from the bottom. It's, uh, this is quite big uh, environmental problem. And of course, uh, we will try to do something, uh, but uh, in near future, not now. But uh, it's underway. Is there any way to just suck it out since it's heavier than the water or is that just gonna disperse it more? Uh, this fuel is uh, heavier than water and uh, this fuel is uh, spreading on the bottom every year because uh, in uh, tanks it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit, it, what does it mean? Maybe 20, 200 tons, maybe, maybe only 100 ton uh, still in, in tanks and it should be removed in professional way because uh, if we start to do uh, 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 work in this area uh, without any good plan, we can do situation worse than that. That is it. It is uh, it is important. And next question is for Anna and Yakub uh, about Papua New Guinea. I've had the pleasure of being there a couple times, and it's a, it's a very interesting place. It's also a little bit scary at times. Uh, I just wanted to know: Is there any region that you think uh, is least affected by by the outside? You know, uh, where the culture is most intact? Oh well, uh, thank you. Uh, we think that uh, the, the Mambaramo bus in uh, in the northern part, north of the Jaya Vijaya mountains, is uh, least affected, um, and there are some spots in the southern part uh, uh, because uh, it, the area is uh, the lowland uh, uh, marshlands are, are really uh, hard to access. We can actually only access by by the river. And that makes uh, them very isolated. And do you have to take any security precautions when you're there? I know we did when we were visiting. Well, uh, well, the the, the, the malaria is uh, yeah, actually uh, uh, back in 2010. I suffered malaria uh, after after the two weeks of stay uh, in in this uh, this zone, and that's but it's part of the fun, I, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I had a friend who went there and he got dengue fever in an Australian hospital for, I think, like a month or something like that. <laughs> well, Anne, uh, do we have any questions from our audience? Yes, I just wanted to say hello to the Polish chapter and you did an incredible job. Just fantastic. Um, you, you covered every, every territory here and, and outside of the earth. So bravo to all of you, just wonderful. So our first question is from uh, Luna uh, from New York. Thank you for your presentation. What percentage 
of underwater caves in China are still not explored. Może zdać, ale jest głośno tutaj. Dlaczego są nie eksplorowane jaskinie w Chinach? Takie um, hello. Um, Go ahead, we... Hi. Um, I think uh, since I was not at this expedition, but I was in contact with Andrzej Ciszewski, who was uh, chief of this expedition, um, I think I will put you just in contact. And so please shoot me uh, an email and I will forward it to Andrew, um, who explored um, uh, the caves in China. And as far as I remember from his presentation, when he first time spoke about um, Chinese caves um, in Warsaw, he told that like 99% of the stuff is unexplored uh, underground in China. So I don't think uh, the situation is different with underwater uh, caves in China. Okay, yes. I, I just wanted to um, ask Hubert, because uh, you didn't really have that much of a chance to um, make a presentation. I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the research that you're doing. Well, first of all, that wasn't my voice during the trailer, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, th that product, pro project took us uh, 10 years of, from our lives. It's finished now. Uh, for the first two years, we were searching archives. And uh, that was also a time for researching the field or researching the water. <laughs> And then we, uh, we did find uh, first objects uh, in 2011. Uh, then we find another mm, tons. Uh, uh, overall, we, we did find more than 20 tons of sculptural decoration from one of the, one, one of the most important palaces in Warsaw, the Kazimierzowski Palace, uh, which, is, which was in 17th century a uh, kind of villa suburbana. Mm. All these objects uh, were down uh, in the, the river in 1656 uh, during the Swedish wars. Uh, the robbery during that time was uh, really huge. Our cities, Warsaw, for example, was treated like a huge quarry. So they ruined uh, our palaces, our villas, our royal castle. And uh, well, this project is finished, but uh, there is a, um, f f from the beginning, beginning that was kind of a legend quest because we knew that there is somebody, there is some, uh, something lying down in the river. Then it turned out that uh, we found, as I said before, more than 20 tons. And now this, uh, all this sculpture decoration, marble things, uh, uh, cannons, cannonballs, uh, uh, are um, combined uh, will be reconstructed and uh, will be one of the most important exhibit in our new museum of the Polish uh, history. So you can see uh, what our project did for for Warsaw and for the museums here. Uh, and now we can say that was uh, a huge uh, all that we found in the river. That was a huge exterior monumental staircase from our Villa Regia, from our palace. You know, having, having watched the film, uh, it's just extraordinary, the type of work that you've done. And uh, how, how deep did you have to go in the river to find some of these artifacts? Because that I think uh, that I was very surprised to hear. <laughs> the, 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 the deeper, uh, the, the river is not, is not very deep one. Uh, it's like one and a half meter uh, six meters deep and something between. Just remarkable. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, so, the, so the depth of the river was not a limiting factor. The visibility and the very strong current, this was really something, uh, something hard. And some of the objects that we recovered uh, were pretty fragile. Like, for example, we recovered um, uh, cannon wheels, wooden cannon wheels that are 350 years old. And uh, they also uh, are now undergoing uh, some uh, conservation and will go on display with the cannons and with the rest of the artifacts recovered. And there is very interesting twist in this story that the museum, Museum of Polish History, is being built right next to the place in which we discovered all 
uh, these wonderful objects. So something what was lost now is recovered and went back on place that is like, you know, a uh, few hundred meters from each other. How, how special is that? It's incredible. I also just want to tell everybody that we have people watching from Australia, from South America, um, Germany, London, all over this country, uh, Ireland, just about everywhere that you can think of. So your message is getting out to people. And I, and I know that that film is going to mean a lot to, for people to see after they've heard a little bit about it from you. So let's see how we can make that available to them. Um, now, my next question is from Laura. Uh, are Incas at the same time period that the Mayans were? Uh, their, their building type seems similar and both their cultures are focused on astronomy. So I was just wondering, who, who would like to take that, Mariusz? Uh, I suppose it's a question for me. Uh, look, uh, if we are speaking about the classic Malaya, it's the time uh, period between the 3rd and the 10th century AD. In the case of the Incas, the uh, Tawantinsuyu, the Inca Empire, uh, began in the very beginning on, of the 15th century. So it's uh, the Incas, from this point of view, if we want to compare the Maya achievement in our uh, astronomy, uh, are uh, earlier, the, the, the Maya are earlier than the Incas. So this is not exactly the same time. Obviously the Maya, the post-classic Maya, uh, are contemporaneous to, uh, to the Incas, but we, uh, the construction of this uh, period of time of the Mayas are not of the same quality and of this same what uh, achievement we may uh, say that those uh, the previous one from the classical period the uh, period so this is a, a difference but uh, mm, comparing uh, there is a big uh, we have a big problem with the incas we have no written uh, records uh, inca records for, uh, from uh, before the conquest and on the other side we have uh, codexes uh, and we have uh, inscriptions of uh, inscriptions on of the Maya. So we know a lot about the uh, astronomy, the calendar of the Maya because we have those records. In the case of the Inca, we have only only the building you have seen uh, in the case of El Mirado. So this is the biggest difference, and I am afraid we will never have. Uh, the same, uh, uh, the same, what to uh, say, knowledge of the uh, of the Inca astronomy than we have on the Maya one. Sorry, but it's sad, but <laughs> that's true. And there's really not much we can do about it, right? Um, so, so I know I know that this was answered in the chat room, but I was wondering, um, maybe Marcin, you can do this, um, whether you can tell the difference between lidar. Uh, wait, wait, whether you can actually um, give people an explanation of the differences between LIDAR, LIDAR and photogrammetry. Uh, the basic uh, difference between LIDAR and photogrammetry is that we, uh, with LIDAR we can see what we could not see with, uh, with a camera. The photogrammetry uh, in the case, for example, uh, if we are speaking about the airborne uh, 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 photogrammetry, you cannot see what is uh, beneath the uh, uh, the trees. In the, uh, with lidar, you can see it. That the first difference. And uh, I, but if we are speaking about the, uh, the about the, the uh, three-dimensional uh, laser scanning uh, terrestrial, uh, there is. Uh, you know, with photogrammetry, it's not very easy to make models, for example, because uh, uh, you may uh, you must do a conversion of your uh, photogrammetric data into digital ones, and next proceed with uh, with uh, with uh, three-dimensional laser scanning. You have immediately a cloud of uh, points, and you uh, uh, have more possibilities. Uh, to make models uh, and such kind of uh, uh, of experiences with models. 
in uh, very short this is the difference but the uh, but speaking about the precision the very good photogrammetry is close to uh, the to, to the uh, three-dimensional scanning or lidar scanning is close in the term of precision this is really a comment but i just wanted to read it to you so that you understand all the different types of people that are watching um hi annie I can see, let's see, where to go? Give me a second now. Just lost it because it's very hard to see what the um, subtitles in here. Bear with me. Okay. I can see, I, I'm hoping that I can see this later. I missed the shipwreck part as my, my mother saw survivors of the Wilhelm Gustloff in Kohlberg, now Kohlberg. One of one of the terrible memories of the war. Now, who was who was talking about that? One of the shipwrecks. Was, was um, that it was it, it was Tomek Stahura uh, to, uh, talking about shipwrecks, uh, and uh, he uh, spoke about Karlsruhe. Uh, that was one of approximately one thousand ships that took part in Operation Hannibal which was this um, operation to take German uh, civilians and wounded soldiers and some troops as well from East Prussia uh, to the uh, Germany part in the West. And um, after the disaster of Wilhelm Gustloff, uh, part of the survivors were taken to Kowabzek uh, in German Kolberg. And uh, the other part was taken, if I remember correctly, uh, to uh, Denmark. And um, I read some recounts about uh, those survivors in uh, Kowabzek, and uh, I, I understand that it was uh, a really uh, painful experience to meet them. Uh, somebody also by the name Alex wrote in and asking, do they remember Osendowski? Um, Osen it depends on uh, uh, who will answer. Perhaps uh, Monica, uh, I may uh, also uh, give some information, but if you prefer Monica, perhaps you uh, may tell more about Osendowski's I, I can do. Monica, are you with us? Oh, I don't, I don't see her. No. Is here Monica? Us. Monica, could you answer that question? Monica, can you answer the question about Osendowski? Maybe she can. So, in short, I will start, and perhaps uh, Monica and uh, and uh, Martin will uh, continue. Osendowski, as you know perfectly uh, uh, well, uh, was a writer, was a soldier, uh, was a politician. A very, uh, very interesting person, and he was also some kind of the Baron of uh, von Münchhausen. So uh, he's uh, telling story, but uh, and writing stories, very interesting ones, uh, related to his personal experiences during during the First World War and next during the Bolshevik Revolution. He was against the Bolshevik. He was. Uh, member, he was soldier uh, of the uh, of the white uh, side in uh, Siberia, precisely, and next in Mongolia. But uh, before that, he was known. Uh, he uh, he was involved in uh, the politics of the very end of the Tsarist Empire, uh, and he was strongly anti-Bolshevik. And he wrote a famous book, a kind of biography, but uh, 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 oh, this was not exactly a biography of Lenin, with a very harsh uh, presentation of uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And he was. This book was published in many languages, and with uh, this he gained uh, uh, fame. Uh, uh, at the international level. One more story about Osendowski of uh, something like uh, Indiana Jones. Uh, he was member of the staff of the famous Baron Ungern. Baron Ungern was a uh, German born but Russian uh, 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 soldier uh, of the cavalry 
and he made a war against the Bolshevik uh, in Mongolia, among others. Uh, he was uh, taken and shot by the uh, Bolshevik, but before that, the legend is that he had time uh, to uh, put in a very safe place a treasure he uh, he collected during the those uh, times in Mongolia and in Siberia, uh, gold, etc. And uh, the uh, conforming to this legend, Osendowski was the person who know uh, uh, where this uh, treasure is hidden. So, uh, uh, so this is a uh, kind of a little uh, Indiana Jones uh, style uh, story. Perhaps uh, Monica can uh, uh, can make uh, another commentaries about Osendowski. Osendowski died in uh, 1945, just before the uh, Soviet army entered uh, uh, the, the town when, uh, where he was living. So Monica? Alex is also asking if any of the modern Polish explorers retrace the expedition. Monica, open your microphone. Your microphone is closed. Upper right corner. Click it. You know, uh, uh, perhaps Marcin. On the top, there is a blue little square. Just move your cursor and you will see it. Click on the top. Unmute, unmute. Okay, I, I've, I have heard about a couple of expeditions that uh, tried to uh, go in uh, Osendowski's footsteps. And um, I think this is, uh, you know, every time uh, you have the opportunity to go to follow uh, someone as colorful as him and uh, to do it, you need to try travel from uh, St. Petersburg to Mongolia, to Japan, to United States. It, it, it has to be very adventurous expedition. And I, I think anyone would like to do it again, would have a lot of fun and a lot of adventures. So, so here's another question. Um, Marcin, it could be Mariusz uh, on Machu Picchu. What additional work do you plan to do on the observatory? Uh, the uh, work on this observatory uh, you have seen, it means uh, 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 El Mirador de uh, Inca Rakai and also the other one, Inti uh, Machai, uh, the Inti Machai was previously investigated by, uh, by our uh, American colleagues, uh, Dearborn, uh, uh, Ray Dearborn and uh, Dave, uh, David Dearborn and Raymond White and Ka uh, Katrin Schreiber would make uh, another kind of study uh, uh, with uh, confirmation of their uh, uh, hypothesis. And now uh, we uh, just in uh, one hour uh, in Lima, a presentation of a book uh, where uh, all those uh, investigations are presented in Spanish uh, will take uh, place in the Ministry of uh, Culture in Lima. I was invited, so I must go there too in a few uh, minutes to take part in this presentation. Uh, what uh, what uh, we plan to do? Uh, we have an agreement with the uh, uh, National Archaeological Park of Machu Picchu, a uh, long-term agreement, and uh, if COVID uh, uh, permits, uh, we will start uh, uh, together with our per Peruvian colleagues because this is in, in the frame of the very close cooperation with uh, uh, with uh, Jose Bastante, uh, the uh, uh, director of the park, uh, excavation of the site of Cantupata and uh, one of the satellite sites of uh, Machu Picchu in very short. So, so this is actually for... Um for I think Anna and Jacob. Uh, it's from Chris Nicola, who happens to be a caver, but he's asking in regards to the tribes being studied in Papua New Guinea, ha um, have increased occurrences of mongoloidism, polydactylism, and or albinoism, all signs of inbreeding been noticed over the years? If so, which regions? 
Uh, well, uh, it, of course, it depends. But uh, given that uh, the populations are uh, fairly isolated, um, uh, there is higher, probably higher than than uh, in uh, in regular uh, conditions than under regular conditions. Also, uh, that uh, some. Uh, recessive uh, genetic traits uh, will uh, pop up so so definitely you see uh, quite a lot of um, uh, albino people among uh, uh, members of uh, of the tribes uh, the the smaller the community the more more present uh, is it uh, regarding the other uh, um, genetic traits uh, to be honest, we haven't observed them. It's not neither polydactylia nor uh, the mongoloidism yeah. uh, 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 is, uh, is, is common. Thank you. Um, here we have another question on what aspects, this is for all of you, what aspects or fields of exploration do you think are very important for Poland and the world beyond in this decade? Tomas, you wanna, you wanna take that? Come You're muted. I don't. Uh, so, <laughs> who wants to uh, speak first? Uh, this one's for this all of very, you. Uh, very broad uh, theme. Uh, I think one of the uh, of the our interest uh, is also to recover the memory of our predecessor as. Uh, uh, some of the uh, person who spoke uh, uh, today tonight sorry uh, mentioned uh, there were uh, for example in the case of uh, uh, schwarz uh, 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 a lot of uh, polish uh, discoverers explorers uh, scientists were practically unknown to the international uh, uh, to the uh, international uh, uh, auditory because of our very complicated situation during the 19th century and the biggest part of the 20th century. So one of the goals of uh, the activities of our chapter is through our own research uh, to uh, recover the memory, uh, the memory of our predecessor. For, from my point of view, uh, is this. To give you an example, uh, in the frame of uh, the activities of the Center of Andean Studies, I am uh, the, uh, the director of it, uh, of the University of Warsaw at Cusco, we uh, offer to the Chilean uh, government two uh, sculptures of Ignacy Domeko, the famous uh, Polish mineralogist and geologist from the 19th century, and also of uh, to the Peruvian of Ernest Maninowski, the engineer who built the highest uh, railway on the world, uh, in the also in the uh, 60s and 70s of the uh, uh, of the uh, 19th century. So to give you an, an example, our colleagues do the same with uh, Scholz Rogozinski in Cameroon, etc. So maybe if I can uh, make a short comment uh, about what uh, has uh, Mario just said. Uh, so there are many, many Poles who are completely for forgotten during uh, the 19th, 20th, but also 18th century. And I think uh, there is a big block of, of work uh, uh, on it. Uh, I, I could mention, for instance, Malinowski, but not this Peruvian Malinowski, but Bronisław Malinowski, uh, surely the best uh, anthropologist in the Pacifics who was working in German, because in the 19th century, it was the only way to, to deal with, with science. And we have many, many examples li like this. And of, of course, uh, uh, Osendowski remains for, for me number one explorer, traveler, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, who, who I would also like to, like to follow. And I, I think as, as Professor uh, Zhukowski said, there is a big work to show that we were deeply involved in, in this exploring of, of different parts uh, of the world. And uh, if we talk about Africa, when uh, I'm uh, now, I'm greeting you from Casablanca, uh, we, uh, I, I want to show through uh, Rogozinski that, that uh, 
Poles had a different vision of Africa, not this colonial vision of Berlin Conference in, in uh, 1885, but we had a completely different vision. And, and uh, as a chief of, of the economic mission in, in, uh, um, in, in Morocco, Polish economic mission, I want to convince that we, are, we, we have not this colonial past and we are very open for Africans like uh, Rogozinski demonstrated a hundred years ago. So, so this is also a, a kind of uh, public relation to show that uh, we were clever explorers, but we are not very well known. Thank you. I, I think, Andrew, did you want to say something too? Tomek. Yep. Um, you can say a lot about this topic. <laughs> Go ahead, Tomek. Uh, hello. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. And yeah, and uh, from my side, I also would like to add that uh, together with our chapter, we are preparing an expedition to Siberia this year, which aim is to conquer the highest peak of Mamsky Mountain in Yakutia, in over part of Yakutia in Siberia. Uh, and our goal is not only to um, to conquer it, um, but also to give it the name because it is still there is this mountain still doesn't have a name i think it, it is interesting that there are still mountains even the highest mount, mountains of the mountain ranges ranges that um, that are unnamed and there are a lot of such a um, such a peaks in siberia and uh, in general siberia was explored by polish uh, discoverers who were at the same time in exile in 19th century. And one of them was, was Wasław Sieroszewski, the man who um, explored and researched Yakutia and Yakutian people. Uh, he's really well known there in Yakutia. He's, I can say, one of the national heroes of Yakutian people uh, due to his research and scientific job. And we, after conquering this peak, we would like to give it the name of Wasław Sieroszewski. So we would like to add another name on the map of the world in this still uncharted territory. So um, the next one, I think we sort of answered in the chat room, but it was about uh, how, how you struggle with the currents when you have to anchor yourself and what to do about it, what the best strategy is. So for any of the divers out there, um, feel free to yeah add. so so when we were diving in the Stola River um, the river as um, Hubert mentioned is pretty shallow it's you know two meters five meters something like that so um, so the depth was not a problem but it was murky and it's very fast river it's um, so you you have to be in, uh, you have to be anchored somehow so we put uh, harnesses like uh, kind of climbing style harnesses, but not uh, the waist one, but uh, the, the, the top part of the harness. And we tied ourselves uh, to the diving boat um, from which we operated. And that was pretty tricky. And that was a bit risky because, you know, if the water is so murky, uh, visibility was sometimes like 10 centimeters, which is, you know, just this you can see. Uh, you don't know what is, in the water in front of you, what is what is coming uh, um, on you? It could be, you know, it could be a tree, for example, fallen tree just in the water. So, we tried to um, put also some metal uh, ropes, metal lines in front of us, like anchor lines. So, in case of some some big trunk is in the water, it could be uh, caught by um, uh, such an obstacle in the river. But that was that was really tricky. So we uh, dived only in the places which were very carefully selected way before that by uh, sonar um, and echo sounders and sub bottom profilers um, uh, results. Thank you. Um, this one is for Andrew and, and, and Andrew. Um, we have been speaking about all the things that you're doing and it's extraordinary and you're also spending a lot of time in um, in the state, but you've opened a school for students in, in Peru as well. Do you want to tell our audience what you're doing over there? And, and maybe some people would like to help you out. Well, um, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher, as I, as, I, as I said in my presentation. So my whole idea was how to improve the life, the future of young dwellers, of young uh, 
native uh, children uh, of the Koka Valley, because most of, most of them are eventually uh, immig immigrating and landing in slums. While riding taxis in Lima, I met three times a driver who was from Kolka. He was very happy but to, to live in Lima, but he was living in, in like a, a wooden box on the slope, on the sandy slope on the, in the suburbs, you know, without any, any perspective driving this dilapidating uh, vehicle. So the school is to uh, prepare these children for work in, uh, with tourists. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, local people are not co uh, communicative because uh, they speak uh, Quechua language. They learn Spanish in school. In some houses, adults don't speak uh, Spanish. And tourists coming, they want to have guide, but they cannot, uh, cannot communicate. So anyway, this year it will be a 20 school. It was only 16 years, but sometimes we spend 10, 12 weeks there. So the, it was like a double school. That's why the numbers don't really... Uh, coincide. Uh, it will be for it will be in the uh, town of Chivai and the Yanke, which is next to it. There are some artists from uh, Arequipa who are living there. They also speak English, but they don't have opportunity to to use it. So they are very very happy if one of us, some of us, are going and we have conversations. So anyway, if someone is really interested, please drop me a line. And I will be happy to send you email and just communicate this this way. Yes, school is going uh, to go. Uh, I'm right now in Poland. We have this vaccination program and I'm in the first group. I mean, there is a zero group now, but then there is a first one. So I hope that we'll be immune to this uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic and it will. the same story will happen in Peru. Let's just hope because we never, we never know. Uh, so please drop me a line and we can communicate direct. Okay, thank you so much. By the way, we all hope that that vaccine is is, is the cure all and we all hope to get it as soon as possible. Um, Benedict, uh, I have a question for you and that's with um, all of the, the, the undersea ordinance that's going on right now with the shipwrecks that you're finding with the oil spills and um, whatever other, you know, dangerous substances are found in those shipwrecks. Uh, what's the best thing that we can do uh, or, or where should we be reading up on this to learn more about it? Yes, it's really a big problem in Baltic Sea, uh, especially in southern part where we have uh, hundreds of wrecks uh, which were armed earlier. And some of them are still have on board a uh, huge amount of uh, munition, conventional munition, uh, some of them are uh, mixed. It means uh, in the middle of the Gulf of Gdansk, we have huge uh, tanker, which have uh, uh, maybe 100, 1,000 tons of fuel, but on deck, there is a huge amount of uh, uh, munition because uh, this vessel, this wreck earlier was uh, a supply vessel for uh, army. Uh, for for uh, 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 German army and uh, German navy, and of course uh, uh, there is a, a big problem with uh, chemical warfare, which is uh, chemical agents which are uh, spread on uh, uh, the bottom, uh, probably close to Borholm. This is uh, on boundary with Polish territorial and maybe not territorial. This is uh, exclusive economical zone. There is uh, 80,000 tons of chemical warfare and uh, still is laying on the bottom in mud, uh, sometimes uh, on uh, sand. And uh, 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 people who are working in this area uh, are uh, uh, sometimes they have contact with these uh, uh, agents, uh, especially with mustard, mustard gas. And uh, this is a big problem. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the best situation is when we could remove this uh, um, old, uh, uh, conventional munition from the bottom or uh, chemical uh, munition. But uh, frankly speaking, it is uh, absolutely uh, not possible now. Mm, of course, we are doing some efforts to uh, remove this. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on, on, on a small group, which is uh, 
under uh, uh, and we are under construction uh, uh, small uh, 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 we can say factory with uh, with uh, high plasma uh, high temperature plasma for destroying uh, this uh, chemical warfare but generally speaking uh, at the moment it's better to not touch uh, this uh, uh, agents uh, these chemical agents because they are too dangerous still and uh, we are not ready yet for uh, operation in this big scale and we can uh, only remove small small pieces of uh, of this uh, uh, munition and of course uh, uh, wrecks uh, are uh, dangerous and what i said in polish uh, uh, economical zone on territorial waters there is 300 wrecks and some of them has munition and uh, some other uh, dangerous ingredients and uh, this is this is for us a big problem but of course future in future we we have to solve this problem thank you thank you monica is your is your, is your microphone on now can you hear me yes we can okay <laughs> So I just wanted to give you the opportunity. First of all, thank you so much for being here with us. And you're getting a lot of people that are saying hello to you from the States, including Jennifer Arnold and someone by the name of Luis. Um, so everybody misses you here in, in, in New York and around this country. Uh, you meant so much to, to us and you're just an, a, an amazing ambassador for the Polish chapter. Uh, uh, is there anything that you wanted to add about Osendowski? Because I know that everybody was trying to um, ask you and you, you, you were muted at that point. Uh, Osendowski was uh, so popular, sorry, so popular. Uh, his literature, his books were so popular that you can compare to Karol May <laughs> and his Venetorial Shatterhand. <laughs> so, um, he, um, he, his books were published in millions and uh, because also people in the West were interested about Russia, but he was the, uh, involved uh, in the revolution, Soviet revolution. And uh, it is interesting that, uh, and of course his book about Lenin, when he died, uh, and uh, he died during the Second War, and uh, uh, his grave was uh, uh, near, war just in the border of Warsaw. And when the uh, Soviet Red Army came here uh, in 1944, 45 in Warsaw, so uh, the Stalin ordered to look for his grave, for Sendovsky's grave, and they found out, and they dig the body to check if Sendovsky is really dead. He's uh, the enemy of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's really, they would like to have proof that he is dead. And of course, still, uh, there was uh, the rumors uh, about the great uh, treasures. Uh, you know, the story is also touched me because my grandfather, you know, millions of people, of Polish people, were taken to Siberia during, uh, during uh, partitions by Tsar and then by Soviets. Also, during First War, my grandfather uh, was in this area, and he knew uh, that he, he was exactly on the same same uh, time and the same place as uh, uh, Baron Unger as Kosendowski. So uh, since childhood, I have heard about this person also and this area. But um, somebody asked uh, what. Uh, about exploration and, and, and about spirit of exploration about the Polish chapter in the Polish chapter also. You know, this is not only our debt to the former generations, to people who explore Siberia, they were taken as prisoners, 
uh, they made researches or they escaped because uh, uh, um, uh, uh, because they were Polish patriots and they built in South America and Peru the first ever polytechnic, the first you know university of technology. Technology. Uh, they 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 also made researches. So do you know that even we didn't know about the forest of Polka Canyon because of martial law? It was in 1980, and uh, uh, the martial law trapped uh, the explorers of Polka Canyon and Andrew Piętowski, Jurek Majerczyk, uh, Piotr Miliński abroad. They couldn't come back to Poland. And for years, for 10 years, 15, 20 years, we really didn't know, maybe 10 years, about the exploration of Polka Canyon. So it is time then we have to um, really to find out uh, Polish exploration because the history of Poland was broken uh, to, to the pieces. And now we are trying to collect all the history, even modern history. And I'm very happy that we have three members of the Olka expedition in the Polish, uh, uh, in the Explorers Club and two uh, in the Polish chapter now. Thank you so much for, for adding all of that. Um, I just wanted to check in with um, Hubert to see what you have planned for the future and what you're gonna be doing next once you get out of uh, lockdown over there, once you're back up and ready to go. Well, this this project, I told you that it's finished, but I'm still thinking it's ongoing, I think, uh, because there are new things uh, concerning uh, archives. So mainly we're still waiting for uh, this uh, museum, which will be open maybe in a year or two years from now. And then we'll see what we can still do with uh, Marcin about the history of this excavations of this project. Well, th the next thing is uh, we are working on is probably um, our collection of zoological, uh, our zoological collection from our University of Warsaw, um, which is uh, something which probably will take another couple of years from our lives. But I think I will tell you in a couple of years about it. Um, and But there is one thing I want to say about our project, about the Vistula one, because it's not only uh, the research, it's not only uh, searching for some, some legend, some myth, uh, uh, it's not only a scholar thing, but this project uh, changed uh, a lot of uh, the way of thinking here uh, in Warsaw about our river which was uh, a little um, forgotten. Uh, and after the situation, uh, when it turned out that at the bottom of the river, there is more than tons of something, maybe even gold. Uh, it's like a river of treasures. Then people realized that uh, there is something more interesting in this, uh, uh, in this river that are uh, uh, crossing our two banks of the of the of the of the city, and it really uh, changed. Also, this project changed uh, the way of thinking about the the river, and also um, uh, taking care of the situation of the archaeological situation uh, in our city concerning uh, the objects uh, lying down at the bottom of the river, not only at the in Warsaw, but also outside the city. Marcin, maybe you can say something also. For me in this project, <clears throat> it was also very interesting uh, Swedish part because we traveled to Sweden. We were looking for uh, such um, other cargoes that did not uh, sink in Warsaw. They did not end up on the bottom of the river in Poland, but made it across the Baltic and uh, went to Stockholm. And um, a lot of Polish things are still 
preserved in the museums in, in Sweden. And it was for me incredible to see uh, how this history unveiled on the other side of the, of the sea um, and how uh, big archives are still to be found in, in, in Swedish libraries, in Swedish museums. There is some kind of continuation of history across the Baltic Sea. So this was for me very interesting in this project. And I think you, you asked what are the plans for, uh, for our chapter. And I think uh, for us as explorers, our goal is to, is to feel, uh, feel uh, white spots on the map. It could be a uh, white spot on the historical map as uh, Mariusz mentioned and, and, and Monica and Tomasz, that we should um, uh, bring back uh, some knowledge about the past, about our ancestors. But also I think very important is um, to uh, fill the blanks, to understand some more about Baltic Sea itself. And this, what uh, could be done by divers and by all the uh, scientists that work on the Baltic, like uh, Benedict mentioned about his research on, on, on shipwrecks and Tomasz and, and our colleagues from Sweden, um, from the Explorers Club uh, from Sweden and Norway. This is remarkable and this is very uh, little known sea and I think, I hope, uh, I'm sure uh, we will have plenty of very, very interesting results in the near future about Baltic Sea. Well, we certainly learned a lot today about the Baltic Sea and we're hoping that the um, Swedish and the uh, Norwegian chapter will reach out to you and maybe you can collaborate on different things together, which would be wonderful. Um, I, I just wanted to also, while I'm at it, ask Mas Masich, how do you pronounce your name? Machik. Machik, sorry. Um, Machik, what are your plans for the future? Yes, uh, when I said in this um, um, short presentation, uh, we still plan to make another uh, longer trip to Gabon. So mm -hmm. On the south of Cameroon, uh, which was uh, explored by Leopold Janikowski, the the comrade um, of, of this um, Rogozinski trip, it was uh, it has to be postponed due to due to, uh, to coronavirus. Uh, but uh, let's say my my, my dream, my, my point is to to work on a biography, because um, what we we have done so far is uh, related. Uh, to checking uh, some facts, rectifying some facts. Uh, in fact, we, we, we did this second trip with, with Tomek who's present here with us. And thanks to being um, in Cameroon, we could uh, discover some, some um, facts which were not clearly explained or even which were not true in, 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 in the literature, it wrote, in what Rogozinski wrote or some, some other people. Uh, then we, we have to uh, make a comparison between what was written by Rogozinski, who was deeply involved in uh, uh, what, what he was doing, but, but then he was commented by Germans. He was, uh, let's say, fighting against Germans who were trying to, to get over um, the, 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 this, this, this part of Africa at those times. So, so he had a very bad uh, press uh, me media for... for from, from Germany, but on the contrary, the British were very positive uh, about what he was doing because, because he was uh, at a certain moment acting on behalf of, of British. The, uh, after he came back from, from the, the trip, he, was, uh, he became a member of the Royal Geographical Society in London. So, so this is um, about checking the facts, but, but to, 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 to put this truth, uh, I would like to make the biography. So this is the step, but, uh, but it is somehow like a PhD in history. So, so it, it, it's a, a longer, a longer, uh, a longer work. But, but first I would like to once again to, to, to go to, to Gabon, Cameroon to, to, to finish this research on, in the field. And, and, and thank you. And, and, and Tomat, um, what about you? What, what does the future hold for you? Um, as I mentioned during my um, short speech, Mm -hmm. um, we are preparing an expedition to Yakutia uh, to reach this highest peak of Momsky Mountain and uh, give, um, give it the name of, um, of Shiroshev, Shiroshevsky. Um, there are four of us. Um, fortunately, um, one of members of our expedition team is very 
experienced um, mountaineer, particularly experienced in conquering mountains in Siberia. So hopefully um, the expedition will be successful. Right now we are planning it for hopefully August. Of course, everything depends on the COVID-19 situation and some uh, limitations in travel to, to Russia. Um, but right now the plan is to go there in August to to reach this in the, the top of the summit um, and um, after coming back um, formally apply to the um, Russian Geographical Society um, for giving the name of, of Václav Sieroszewski. Um, so yes, so this, this, this is the plan for the next months. So for those of you who don't know, Tomas um, uh, had a presentation in New York um, about two years ago and it is online and it is archived for those of you who want to go back and take a look at it because it was quite an impressive presentation. So thank you again for be, for doing that. Um, and and fi finally, before we go back to Mariusz, I just wanted to ask Anna and Jacob um, what, what you have planned next. We also have somebody in the Norwegian chapter that's been doing a lot of work on um, anthropological uh, uh, studies on, um, on tribes, uh, but, uh, and, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with them. But what, what's your plans for the future? Oh, so this year, uh, um, when the lockdown, we started pack rafting. So, so, so uh, we learned it's a really convenient way uh, to, to move uh, along the rivers in the remote areas because you can carry uh, pack raft uh, with the full gear uh, in your back backpack. So uh, we are planning, uh, together with our friend Dominique Schmaida, uh, to follow uh, one of the uh, old trade routes uh, in uh, Papua uh, from the uh, stone quarries where they still uh, make uh, tools, uh, the tools that they use uh, um, out of stone, and they trade them with uh, the people living in the lowlands. Uh, so we want to uh, travel along the very ancient trade route and then uh, use the pack rafts to, to get to the, to the sea through the Asmat region. Um, and next trip, uh, we, are, uh, we are planning to, in the northern part, out on the Mamberamo uh, River, uh, together, maybe together with Maciej Tarashin. Uh, the guy who is exploring um, uh, uh, jungle and um, uh, rivers in uh, Colombia for for past uh, few years. Thank you so much. Uh, so now back to you, Mariusz. You started us off this evening, and I just wanted people out there also to be aware of a little-known fact that you told me the other day about. Um, Polish people that came to the United States early in the 1600s. So for everybody's um, uh, curiosity about what, what were Polish people doing here in the early 1600s? Can you share that information with everyone? You're muted. Mariusz, you're muted. You're still on mute. Mariusz? Yeah, okay. There you now. go. I'm really, I apologize, I didn't send you the link, but I remember it, I will send you. Uh, I was speaking about uh, the co British colony in those times, in the 17th century in uh, uh, Virginia, more precisely in the uh, 1620, the Polish uh, were uh, workers, or better to say specialists, uh, because the uh, timber uh, was one of the, uh, what to say, of the principal uh, uh, material uh, for uh, uh, for pr uh, um, uh, uh, in uh, in this uh, colony, and uh, the uh, British lacked uh, the uh, specialist in uh, in this kind of uh, uh, of um, the profession, so they contracted. Uh, some specialists from Poland, from the northern Poland, uh, and uh, uh, those people went to uh, to the British uh, Virginia on th those time. But there was a, a kind of social problem uh, because when uh, it came to uh, election uh, to the local uh, authorities of the colony, uh, the Poles uh, were excluded for the possibility to vote. 
So uh, they went angry and uh, organized a strike uh, to gain those rights to vote. And they, uh, and they won. They received. So we may say that the Poles are uh, on the, uh, what to say, of, uh, the pioneers of the trade unions in the territory of North America, <laughs> from this point of view. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Monica knows well uh, this, uh, this history and uh, they can uh, complete it with other details. Uh, can I add? Sure. Uh, so it was Jamestown. Uh, it was Jamestown and those specialists, they were Polish noble people. But uh, in Poland, noble people know how to work. <laughs> they have um, nice places, they were landlords, but they knew how to work. And uh, John Smith asked, uh, he, he was also an interesting person, and um, because uh, mm, he fought against um, uh, Turkish, then he was uh, uh, in jail, then he escaped to Poland and uh, now a new uh, Polish people. And when the first group came to Jamestown, uh, to Virginia, uh, it was a problem because there was no fresh water. There was uh, the Indians, the native people were against them. And John Smith sent to London and sent to his, uh, to the people whom he knew. And uh, five Polish people came. And for example, the first, last factory, they did it. Uh, they uh, had uh, materials uh, and um, things to exchange with the Indian. And uh, we know that, as a matter of fact, uh, Pocahontas <laughs> and uh, that story, the Polish people were very involved. And uh, one uh, of them, um, one of them, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, helped to the rescue life of John Smith. Uh, so, uh, they made uh, also, they, they dig their well uh, with the fresh water and they helped to survive Jamestown. So, they were just beginnings, uh, were very involved with uh, Polish people, beginning of United States. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's just an incredible piece of, you know, information for all of our viewers and uh, something that we knew very little about, except that Polish people are incredible explorers and also very hardworking now because they're doing a lot of the work that's taking place in the Explorers Club and doing all the incredible work on the, the wood paneling that dates back many centuries as well. So uh, I think, you know, and I think that, it's, uh, you know, we had uh, democracy. Uh, and since uh, Middle Ages, uh, our uh, noble people, educated people, and from universities, Middle Ages, uh, uh, they 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 um, they had they gave the law uh, to leave uh, the countries, uh, for example, with other religions to feel equal, really democracy, that people are equal. And uh, when they travel in next centuries, or they had to escape because of wars, uh, or of occupations or uh, partition, uh, uh, um, partitions, the, the Polish people always treat uh, uh, the local people as friends, friends, as uh, equal people, as partners. And the exploration was easier because they were welcomed by the local people. They didn't feel like, a, you know, I am white. I am, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, like, the, like really con uh, um, conquerors. But uh, they treated local people uh, as a partners. That is why the history of Polish exploration is so interesting in the materials, but we have to find out the look for some documents, some materials, such people, because in Siberia, many tribes were described 
by the people, Polish people, who went there as a prize owner. And then they described the language, the, <laughs> uh, the customs, uh, habitat. So it's, it's really interesting to follow all the traces of those uh, explorers. Well, thank you so much, because it's just incredible information that, that we're learning tonight from all of you about our own history, about our own country. So we really do appreciate it. And um, I just want to thank every single one of you. Mariusz, you put together an incredible program between Mar Marcin, Tomas, uh, Monica, Marsek, uh, who else do we have? Anna and Jacob, Hubert, Andrew, and, and Benedict. This was wonderful. I also have to make a big shout out to an honorary member of your team, uh, Luis, who helped to put all of this together, and Alex as well, who are in the background and working very hard to make this possible for everybody. Um, what do you say, Tim? An incredible chapter yet again. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for their very informative presentations. That was, uh, was very amazing. Uh, again, also Luis for putting this all together. Uh, he had to piece together all these individual videos. He spent, I'm sure he spent a lot of time on this. And of course, Ann Passer, without whom Chapter Connect would not exist. Finally, I want to thank you, our audience, for your enthusiastic participation, because it's your participation that makes this such a worthwhile experience for all of us here. Thank you so much. And what do we have on tap for next week? Starting on Monday, we have a program on plate tectonics and great earthquakes um, with Steve Picar and our host uh, and our um, guest for the night is Lynn Sykes, who's really the the father of plate tectonics. So it's going to be an incredible lecture. And also uh, on Tuesday night, we have one of our club favorites, George Clunas, the chapter chair of our Canadian chapter, along with Jason Harper, it's sort of like a part two. So if we're doing earthquakes on Monday, we're doing when disaster strikes, readiness in the field and home. So you're prepared if something happens. Uh, clearly it won't cover everything, but we'll do our best to, to make it work for everyone. Of course, so, none of us ever end up in that position, of course, right? Yeah, exactly, because <laughs> explorers are, you know, they're always prepared for everything. So I just want to thank everybody, everybody who's on the line today, everybody who's watching, and um, the entire Polish chapter. You have an amazing group of people. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we hope to see you all soon in person. And thank I would you like to thank much. you. Uh, I would like to thank yeah. you, uh, you from the uh, from the headquarters in New York for inviting us. I hope this is not the last meeting we have with you because uh, we have twenty more members, and every one of them have his own very interesting research to present. And to finish, I would like to announce something perhaps more related to the United States and to Americans than, uh, uh, than the Siberia. I am speaking about the Micronesia. And uh, uh, next year we will start a program of commemorating uh,